welcome to the Arthropod Genomics Virtual Symposium uh, Spring 2024. Uh, this is our, our fourth iteration, fourth year of doing this. So welcome everybody to uh, session one, where we'll we talk about the production of insects for food and feed. Again, next slide, please. All right, this is a, a joint effort between the USDA, uh, United States Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Research Service, uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, the NIH, as well as the I5K, which is a uh, collection or uh, colloquium of uh, researchers from around the world, uh, kind of dedicated to the sequencing of 5,000 arthropod genomes, while on our way, obviously, with the new technologies that are out there. So as I said before, uh, happening now is our session one production of uh, insects for food and feed. Uh, thanks very much to uh, Kristen Duffy, Duffield, as well as Brenda Oppert for being the organizers uh, of this session, as well as our speakers who we'll be getting to later. Second session coming up, I actually have two of them in April. Second session being Insect Genome Biology and Evolution by Lindsay Perkin, also from USGA ARS. Session three, the covering the Genome 100 and Comparative Bee Genomics. That'll be headed up by Jay Evans and Michael Brenstetter. And a fourth session by the NIH colleagues uh, showing off their comparative genome resources, uh, the NCBI toolkit and tools uh, for unlocking arthropod genome research. So even though this is a, a generalized toolkit, uh, they're gonna be very focused on the arthropod angles, obviously. And the dates are listed here. Uh, we do have a, a QR code that you can scan straight off the screen if you haven't got the information for it already, as well as a website link there for our uh, registration form. So next slide, please. So this is all made possible, again, through our collaboration with the USGA, NIH, and uh, I5K. But special thanks to the people who kind of work in the background as well to get all those support services are very important for keeping this moving. Uh, we have Kevin Hackett, our national program leader, uh, myself, where I coach the, uh, I'm the lead organizer of this. Glenn Haynes, person working in the background who gets our technical, uh, technical lead, gets all those things worked out and the kinks ironed out for us. Anna Childers, who runs the website and Twitter feeds. Thea Olson, who handles all the videos. And Rob Waterhouse, who does the Slack channel, a lot of the other stuff with the i5K in general. Next slide, please. So we have several different information resources out there for you. Obviously, you hope you're knowing about the uh, website. Um, you have the registration form, which you've obviously visited, and lets you know that there's a YouTube channel for these videos, as well as videos from the upcoming sessions and all AGS sessions in 2021, 22, and 23 are now located, uh, so you can easily access those, those through that link. As well as you want to join the Slack channel, it does require registration if you're not already a member of that Slack channel for the i5K, uh, but the link is right there, and uh, please click on that or take a quick screen capture or photo with your phone, and you can have all that information to you. And it probably might put some of this information into the chat for you as well during the sessions. Um, so next slide, and I will turn this over to Chris and Duffield, our lead organizer for the session. Thanks so much, Brad. Um, and thanks to the rest of the AGSX team for help running the show today. My name is Kristen Duffield. I am a research entomologist postdoc co-located in the southeast and midwest areas. And I am joined today by Dr. Brenda Oppert, who is a research molecular biologist in the Plains area. Both Brenda and I are very excited to continue to host a session at AGSX that highlights the research that is supporting the emerging field of insect agriculture. And that's because we are challenged globally with feeding a growing population in the face of a rapidly changing climate. At the same time, we currently waste about 40% of all the food we produce. And so clearly we need innovative solutions to sustainably manage the resources we have to provide nutritious food to everyone. And insects are increasingly appreciated as one of these solutions as they are highly nutritious, are a highly nutritious source of fats, proteins, and micronutrients and can be reared year round with comparative, comparatively less food and water inputs. And furthermore, they will happily feed on our waste products, including agricultural and municipal waste, and even manure and plastics, making them an integral part of a circular economy. So today we're, we will be hearing from research across industry and government agencies working to make insect agriculture a viable and sustainable solution to some of our most critical challenges in agriculture. And so today you may have seen that we have a slight 
last minute change in schedule, but today we're going to hear from Dr. Monica Pavaripal from the US FDA, Dr. Alita Espinosa from EnviroFlight, which is a black soldier flight company based in North Carolina, and finally from myself. Um, and just for a run of show today, we will be playing each speaker's pre-recorded talk and then bringing them on live for a Q&A session immediately following um, that talk. And then we're going to follow up with a final Q&A with all three speakers. And as a note, we want you to please feel free to ask questions as you have them, but please use the Q&A feature of Zoom specifically and leave the chat for general comments. Okay, so let's kick off today with our first presentation from Dr. Monica Pavaripal, a research entomologist in the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, who will today tell us about her research using metagenomic, a metagenomic sequencing approach to identify insects in food products. So I'll now let Pia take over with the recording. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Ella, for inviting me to be part of this AGSX virtual symposium session. This represents a great opportunity for the FDA to reach stakeholders and provide more information on the topic of insects as food and combine it with an update of the, the research being conducted at FDA CIFSAND related to the identification of insects that can potentially be found in food and the identification of insects, a species that are being marketed as food. The title of my presentation today is a metagenomic next generation sequencing approach for evaluating the identity of insects as food. Uh, but before we get into the presentation, I have to read the disclaimer slide specifying that the findings and conclusions in this research are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views or the official position of the FDA. The names of vendors or manufacturers are provided as examples of available product sources. Inclusion does not imply endorsement of the vendors, manufacturers, or products by the FDA or by the Department of Health and Human Services. All right, having said that, this is the overview of my presentation today. First, I will briefly mention historical perspective of insects as food, followed by FDA jurisdiction, wild harvested versus farmed insects. Then I will briefly um, mention food safety aspects, whole insects and insect derived ingredients. Then I will mention uh, current metagenomics research for the identification of insects and its applicability for the identification of insect species that are being marketed as food. Let's begin with the historical perspective. There is ample anthropological information suggesting that human beings have been eating insects for centuries, if chosen to do so. In fact, insects have been and currently are part of the diet in many cultures worldwide. Although in recent years, there has been an increased public interest concerning insects as alternative food resources, the FDA has been looking into this issue for more than 45 years. Uh, you can see several uh, publications by FDA personnel here to the right. Therefore, this is not new to the FDA. And this, this actually takes me to the next slide, which refers to FDA jurisdiction of insects as food, right? So you may be familiar with this definition, which is the definition of food. Under the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, the term food means articles of food or drink for man or other animals, chewing gum, articles used for components of any such article. Therefore, FDA has jurisdiction over insects as food. In other words, within the limits imposed by the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, if insects are used as food, then they will be subject to all pertinent sections of the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act under which foods are regulated. 
Uh, well, uh, the total number of insect species used as food is debatable. While there are some reports with estimated numbers, there is currently insufficient data to truly know the quantity of the insect species that are consumed by humans. In 2017, John Jima listed 2,111 insect species as, as being used for food. Uh, in 2022, this number was revised by Band Eiterbeck and Pelosuelo, and they reported this number to be just about like 76% of those reported by John Jima, which give uh, about 1,611 insect species. Also, in this slide, you can see uh, a report by several authors, including FAO, regarding the estimated percentages of insect species that are uh, mostly consumed through the world, organized by major taxonomic groups. Let's move on to mention the topic of wild harvested versus farmed insects. It's been reported that about 92% of insect species used as food are wild harvested and 2% are farmed, which can range from breeding to insects in small cages to larger scale breeding. Uh, let's talk about wild harvested insects first. So I already mentioned that there are historical sociocultural practices of eating insects. In many countries, insects are seasonally collected for food from the agricultural land and forest. We know actually that many insect species spend the life cycle underground. But even if they don't, wild harvested insects have the potential of carrying foodborne pathogens and chemicals such as pesticides. There is quite extensive scientific literature on that subject. Now, there is also the topic of bioaccumulation because insects can accumulate contaminants from soil. Of course, bioaccumulation of contaminants depend on many factors, such as the type of chemical, the insect species, life stage, etc. A scientific evidence shows that heavy metals, lead, arsenic, mercury, and cadmium are bioaccumulative. Now, farm insects. I am referring to insects specifically raised for food because insects raised for animal food cannot be diverted to human food. Let me repeat that. Insects raised for animal food cannot be diverted to human food. According to FAO, farming insects for food is relatively recent. There are industries from a small scale to large scale production. And uh, there are several factors to consider for mass green insects. One of those is the feeding and substrate. Um, hopefully, the insects are going to like the substrate, are going to fit from in, and there is the also, uh, it's going to be abundant and inexpensive. The substrate actually used in the farming environment is strongly influence insect microbiota. Thus, industry should carefully think about the substrate to use when reading insects meant as food and avoid uh, obvious uh, potential risky substrates such as waste, including food waste or processed uh, animal proteins such as blood uh, products. Reading materials uh, can also be uh, can also determine if there are any potential risks to consider here. For example, consider the risk of using uh, used egg uh, cartons because the surface of the egg may potentially be contaminated with food pathogens such as salmonella and campylobacter. Another example is the um, stereoform and plastics such as polyestyrene and polyethylene. There are reports that yellow mealworm and superworm can degrade these types of materials materials. However, more research is needed to show the safety aspect of using insects as food after reading insects in this type, type of uh, materials. Food safety aspects. This is a big topic for sure required in several symposia, not just one slide as seen here. This list is by no means all inclusive, 
but I will use it to serve as a reminder that there are many potential hazards related to insects as food. As any other food, industry or manufacturers need to be aware of all potential hazards and the risks to consumers associated with a specific food product and need to gather information that they should consider to evaluate all potential hazards for a specific food product. Now, the risks associated with rearing insects as food depend on many factors, such as those uh, I just mentioned in previous slide, the feeding substrate and materials used to rear the insects. Also, how insects are farmed, harvested, and processed, among many others, uh, many other factors. There are uh, biological hazards, including foodborne bacteria, both vegetative and spore forming, and also viruses and parasites. Chemical hazards include, among many others, mycotoxins, heavy metals, pesticides, and dioxins. Allergens is the, another food safety hazard to consider because there is ample scientific evidence supporting that people that are allergic to shellfish may also be allergic to insects. And this is because crustaceans, insects, and arachnids are all arthropods from the phylum Arthropoda. So, and uh, tropomycin, which is the major muscle protein in crustaceans, is the protein that has been identified as the major shrimp allergen. That protein actually um, shares, shares similarities with uh, tropomycin from insects and arachnids. Therefore, there is potential for cross-reactivity between insects and crustacean shellfish, and this represents a health risk for those people that are allergic to shellfish and consume insects as food. Physical hazard is also a concern, particularly because some insects may have hard and sharp appendages, such as stings, wings, rostrum, and spines. Again, the potential food safety hazard, hazards of insects as food also apply to many other foods, not only to insects, and industry need to be aware of these hazards and potential risks to consumers. Whole insects and insect derived uh, ingredients. Whole insects sold as food in the market are usually uh, ready to eat or RTE food, whereas insect derived ingredients are usually non RTE food. Both whole insects and insect derived ingredients marketed as food must be safe to eat must be wholesome, meaning not adulterated with insect filth or any other foreign or extraneous matter. Uh, the potential hazards, including um, biological, chemical, as well as allergens and physical hazards, are pertinent to both whole insects and insect-derived ingredients. In many parts of the world, insects sold to consumers are generally roasted or fried. Uh, those are steps that are effective in eliminated uh, football pathogens. However, recontamination or cross-contamination risks arise if, if the insects are not hygienically handled or stored before consumption. So industry should be aware and must follow preventive controls rules rule when appropriate. Let's move um, to the topic of our current research. And I will start by saying that uh, uh, some authors have written that, a, I quote, FDA should also develop a test to distinguish between insects as food and insects as filth, and should consider using intent to distinguish between insects as food and insects as filth, unquote. We hear you. So in the next slides, I will mention current research being conducted at CIFSAN FDA to detect and identify insect contaminants in food, also known as insect filth. And then I will mention how this research is applicable to insects as food. I will start by saying that insect uh, are classified in many different groups. However, for regulatory purposes, insects can generally be separated in two different groups, unavoidable and avoidable. Unavoidable insects refer to those that are filled 
filled the pests or insects that attacked crops in the field. These uh, field pests are considered unavoidable, naturally occurring, and non-hazardous, and they are pretty much the basis for the FDA's food defect action level. Avoidable, on the other hand, refers to those insects that contaminate a food product after being harvested or during storage, transportation, etc. These are mainly storage insect pests and also uh, non vector of uber pathogens such as flies. And they are more likely present in, in a food product because there was a lapse in good manufacturing practices. Therefore, regulating insect contaminants in a food product uh, is, uh, we consider a series of factors, uh, and we need uh, some information such as the number of insect fragments that are present, the type of insects that are present in a food commodity, etc. So, our current research focuses on insects uh, as fill uh, or insect contaminants in a food product. But uh, we are also using this child good metagenomics and expanding this research for the potential applicability, applicability to insects uh, as food, both uh, whole insects and insect derived ingredients. Uh, we started our current research by com this research actually combines the use of uh, insect mitochondrial genomes or mitogenomes and combine these with the uh, next generation sequencing technologies. This research is started by sequencing and annotated in-house mitochondrial genomes or, of uh, several insect species, including field pests, uh, food uh, storage pests, known vector of food pathogens, and other insect species used as food. We sequence and annotated in-house a total of uh, 81 insect species that were either in our lab or acquired from other sources. And they belong to the seven orders listed here. About 53% of them were newly annotated insect mitogenomes, meaning they were not included in gene bank. For example, we uh, sequenced the uh, mitochondrial genome of the house cricket, Akita domesticus, which was actually the first time this mitogenome was sequenced. We call this reference collection of insect mitogenomes the mitochondracker. Uh, the mitochondracker then grew beyond insects and um, we just included another insect, not just the ones that we sequenced in-house. So we include mitogenomes that were available in GBank, right? And that included another eukaryote. It currently contains about 20,000 eukaryote mitogenomes with uh, arthropods, that is insects and arachnids, covering about 28% of the reference, reference collection. Other mitogenomes included are from from plants, fish, birds, uh, proteins, and many other. Thus, this uh, reference collection represents a perfect opportunity to detect and identify insects from a variety of plant and animal-based uh, food products. After compiling the mitochondrial reference collection, uh, our bioinformatician constructed the Mitochamer database. And the first thing that I would say for those of us that are not bioinformaticians or work in the genomics arena is that a kamer is a term that is used to represent a nucleotide sequence of a specific length, which in our case, case is 30 nucleotides long. So here to your right, you can see a simple schematic representation of what constitutes a KMER database, which is the, a collection of overlapping sequence fragments from a mitogenome of a specific organism. So imagine cutting in small fragments all 20,000 circular mitogenomes that we have in our mitochondrial reference collection. 
That will give us millions of sequence fragments or claimers, and then we store all those fragments in a specific place, which in this schematic representation is a box, but in reality they are methodically stored in a computer pipeline that is now publicly available and accessible through, through FDA Galaxy Tracker. What comes next is very interesting because we use mitogenomes uh, from insects to design the insect baits. And I am referring here to molecular baits or short uh, DNA, uh, short fragments of oligonucleotide sequences that hybridize to target DNA. To do that, we attached um, those oligonucleotide sequences from insects to magnetic bits and put magnetic bits here and put them in a specific panel or a kit that could be used in the lab. This was done to increase the detection uh, limits of uh, insects that may be present in a food because they are usually present at low levels. Uh, to the right, right is a quick representation of how target capture works using this the custom um, panel of insect baits. So the insect baits target and capture and the insect DNA here in yellow color, separating, separating it from the bulk DNA, which contains mainly food DNA here in black color. To be then further amplified, uh, increasing the sensitivity of detection of insect species that may be present in a food product because a big portion of the background food DNA if is left behind. Uh, in this slide, there is a graphical representation we created at FDA, and I am hoping to explain how data uh, that is obtained from next generation sequencing is analyzed and how taxonomic assignments are done to the sequence reads in a computer using the tree structure. So let me try to explain this algorithm for taxonomic classification. At uh, the bottom of uh, this schematic representation, we have the famous lineage taxonomy system showing the hierarchy of the biological classification, uh, starting at the center with the tree of life at the domain level for eukaryotes. This is uh, then subdivided uh, into further taxonomic groups, including kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and uh, species, which are placed to the corner of this representation of the tree of life. We uh, also added to this uh, schematic representation, the k-mers that uh, are here at the bottom of this uh, uh, graphic uh, representation. And remember, this is all happening in a computer uh, algorithm. So how it works. So the sequence reads that are obtained are compared to our mitochamers database. And when a sequence finds a good enough match of a unique kamer uh, in the database, then the sequ sequence is assigned to that corresponding taxonomic group. And the algorithm, algorithm process continues until all sequence reads are placed within the taxonomic tree structure making classifications with the most probable positions. So as an example, let's say we analyze a food and this food actually contains um, a, a pest of stock products. Let's say it's the granary weevil, which is the Cytophilus granarius from the family Curculionidae, right? So that specific species of insects is in our database. Thus, the majority of insect reads, if not uh, all, will be placed there. In case the specific species um, is not in our database, but other insect species from the same genus is, sequences will be placed or assigned to the um, genus level. And if the genus is not uh, in our database, then uh, they will be placed to the family level. Uh, let's say this is Curculioni in this case, and it, the algorithm continues that way. So I hope I, I gave a, a more or less explanation of how tree is structured for assigning taxonomic groups work. So uh, to, as a proof of concept for our research, including uh, metagenomics, next generation sequencing, and the uh, taxonomic assignment of tree structure, we wanted to check the specificity and accuracy of insect baits 
and they respond to the target analyte in a food background. For this, we used five different insect species from three different taxonomic orders and one food matrix, which was the corn meal. We extracted genomic DNA from them and then we combined per triplicate um, DNA from the corn milk with individual insect species and then DNA from a mixture of insect species at three different DNA levels, which I call here high, medium and low, according to the uh, uh, total mass of insect DNA that was added. Then uh, we processed, we proceeded to prepare the libraries for sequencing. We also did the target enrichment, so we had libraries with base and without base. Uh, and then sequencing them using the Illumina MySeq platform. This graph shows the results when combining genomic DNA from corn meal here in yellow color with individual insect species. The x-axis shows libraries prepared with baits and without baits, and the y-axis shows the percent relative abundance of the sequence rate. We can see that in all samples, the sequence rates from the corn meal um, actually decreased when using baits, which actually greatly increased the sequence rates from all five insect species that we evaluated. Also, all of these the insect species were um, identified accurately to the species level. Here, uh, we have uh, this graph is actually showing the results when we combined the corn meal again here in, in yellow color with the three mixtures of uh, insects with and without bait. If you recall, we have three different uh, mixes, high, medium, and low, according to the mass of insect DNA that was added. Like in previous graph, sequence reads from the corn meal decreased in libraries with baits. And uh, actually that allowed for maximizing the sequence reads of, of the insects, regardless of the uh, food background that was present. And all the insects were identified accurately to the species level, even when we added two closely related species, such as these two flower beetles, Trivolium castaneum and Trivolium confusium. So we definitely had our proof of concept that target capture with insect baits increased sequence reads of insects in a food background. So now let's move on to talk about the, applic the applications of this metagenomics approach for insects marketed as food. So we selected both um, insect salts as whole and also some insect derived ingredients. And we use three replicates, for example, that we analyzed. For whole insects, we selected seven different products, including queen weaver ants. The label, the um, ingredients list panel in the food label listed Ocheophila species. We also selected our Orthoptera mix. This included grasshoppers and crickers with some spices that were added. Uh, we also had roasted crickets. Uh, we um, evaluated here um, three different flavors, honey mustard, barbecue, and curry, and the ingredients list panel mentioned roasted crickets and other ingredients according to the seasoning or the flavor that was being marketed. We also had grasshoppers. We evaluated two different products. One included grasshoppers from the, ex the species actually Oxia giso and that was on the label, and the other was labeled as season grasshoppers. For insect-derived ingredients, we evaluated five different products, cricket cookie mix, which listed the house cricket Akita domesticos among other ingredients. We also evaluated uh, cricket powder, two different products. One listed organic uh, cricket powder as ingredient, the other listed powdered Akita domesticos, and uh, we also had two different cricket uh, flower products, one describing uh, um, cricket protein powder in the ingredient uh, ingredients uh, list uh, panel, and the other listed uh, cricket flower Akita domesticos as ingredient. Well, we did, again, the whole thing. Uh, let me just say that we extracted genomic DNA and the DNA, we, we obtained DNA from really good quality, even though the uh, um, 
products were like highly processed, roasted, dried, even like well converted to powder. Uh, here are the sequencing results of insects marketed as food. So let's talk about these whole insects first. Weaver ants of the genus Oecophila was listed as the ingredient in, in this product. However, we do not have this genus in our database. We do have about 130 different genera from about 300 genera that are describing this uh, formicity. And, uh, but since we do not have the genus Oecophila, 100% of the sequence reads according to the tree structure aligned with the family formicity. And this is what we are seeing here, here at the bottom of this graph. Orthoptera mix, well, the ingredients listed include the grasshoppers, uh, mole crickets, and uh, house uh, crickets as well. So 36% of the sequences were assigned here to the house cricket. About 7% were of the sequent reads were assigned to the three different species of uh, mole crickets. 50% were assigned to the family grillidae, and about 2% of the sequences were assigned to the migratory uh, locust, uh, agras hopper. So all of them belong to orthoptera, aligning to what is written in the ingredient list for this uh, orthoptera mix. Uh, roasted crickets, we did have these three different flavors here, honey mustard, barbecue, and curry. Sequences were assigned mainly to the house cricket, but also to the uh, teleogrillost genus, and some to the family grillidae. All of them are crickets. So, oh, well, interestingly, the barbecue uh, flavor listed uh, chili pepper, as an ingredient, and there were actually some sequence reads that were assigned to Capsicum anum, which is the plant species for chili pe pepper. So those sequences are not seen here in the graph because they are among the um, few sequence reads that were comprising these the other general less than 1% group. All right, let's move to grasshoppers. Um, grasshoppers, we evaluated these two products, one label as grasshoppers, ingredients list, uh, the ingredients list panel mentioned grasshoppers of the species actually Oxia gisoensis. We do have seven species of uh, Oxia in our database. However, no sequences were assigned to this uh, genus Oxia. Instead, 27% of the sequences were assigned to Seracris kiangsa, which is the yellow spined um, bamboo locust, and 38% of the sequences to the genus Seracris, meaning uh, those sequences belong to other species in the Seracris genus that are different from the six Seracris species that we have in our database. The remaining 35% of sequences were assigned to the family Acrididae. But again, no sequences from the genus Oxia, and according to taxonomy assignation of sequences for our tree structure, if this is indeed an Oxia species, this should be listed. But results here differ from, our, from the species that is mentioned in the ingredients list panel. The other product that we evaluated was labeled as seasoned grasshopper, which con contains semi semi-dehydrated grasshoppers. Here, 100% of these sequences were uh, <clears throat> assigned to the family Acrididae. No specific genus or species was assigned to those in our database, perhaps because they are different from to the 60 genera that we have in our database. Uh, well, by the way, the, I would like to add that these results may change as we continue adding species to our database and we reanalyze the, the sequence data. So we are making this database more comprehensive. All right, let's talk about <clears throat> insect derived ingredients here. Cricket cookie mix. Actually, uh, this is interesting. In this product, 22% of the sequences were assigned to the housed cricket. Uh, Akita domestica, domesticus, and here we also have some, some sequences assigned to plants, including um, the rice, rice sativa, 
and sorghum by color here. And actually the ingredients list panel includes flour from rice and sorghum aligning to what was included on the label. For the cricket powder, there were two different products evaluated here, organic cricket powder powder. So the graph shows that 92% of the sequences were actually assigned to uh, the Grilli D family cricket and other 8% um, to sequences to the genus Teleogrillus. But no sequences were assigned to the species level, unlike the other cricket powder um, that was analyzed. The mention powder Akita domesticos as ingredient. And here, 100% of sequences were assigned to Akita domesticos, the house cricket. Lastly, uh, we have that both uh, samples of uh, cricket uh, flower have the majority of sequences assigned to the house cricket and remaining sequences to the family level, which align to the ingredients list. So these results actually show how our metagenomics research for uh, insect uh, adulterants can be used for the identification uh, of the species that are being marketed as insects as a food. All right, before ending my presentation, I will mention FDA's perspective on the su subject of insects as food. As mentioned earlier, within the uh, limits imposed by the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, if insects are used as food, then they would be subject to all pertinent sections of the Food, Drug and, and Cosmetic Act under which foods are regulated. Food must be safe and may not bear any added poisonous or deleterious substance that is unsafe. Manufacturers have the responsibility to ensure that the food they produce for the United States market is safe and complies with the Act and FDA's uh, implementing regulations. Again, whole insects and insect derived products must not be adulterated, and their processing, packaging, storage, and transportation must occur under proper uh, sanitary conditions. Uh, FDA advises that shellfish allergic consumers should avoid eating insects because insects share a family relation with shellfish and can trigger uh, an allergy reaction. Also, FDA advises that anyone intended to use an insect derived substance as a food ingredient consult with CIFSAN Office of Food Additive Safety. And here is the email address. Uh, lastly, I would like to acknowledge the great work of other people from other offices in FDA Safe Sand that are involved in this collaborative research project, Padmini Ramachandran for excellent work and expertise in the genomics area, Liz Reed, our visual expert, Mark Mamel, our bioinformatician who designed all the databases, and Amy Miller for managing the insectarium at Safe Sand. Uh, with that, I thank you for your attention and I will be happy to uh, take uh, questions if, if you have some questions. Thank you. All right, thanks, Monica. I would invite you to, to come on the screen. Brenda, also, if you'd like to, to join us. Uh, wonderful presentation. We have a couple questions uh that that we can go through and also i wanted to invite all the participants if you would like to um speak your question just raise your hand and we can promote you um otherwise just keep putting those in the in the q a so i'll start with uh the un, the open question that we have now from lindsay um she asked a great question when i was thinking myself so can we use your bait system galaxy track tracker to identify uh, pathogens, potential pathogens in insect-based products? Yeah, this is a great question. Thank you so much for asking that one, Lindsay. Uh, the uh, Galaxy Tracker actually contains another trackers, not only this one for eukaryotes. Um, there is, um, in Galaxy Tracker, there are another um, 
that can be used for pathogens such as Kraken. So, however, the use of insect baits is just starting to be used. I would say that we are a little bit more advanced in the use of baits for insects and arachnids than for prokaryotes, but the FDA is definitely working on baits for some specific football pathogens as well. And as soon as they are ready, they will be available in the uh, Galaxy Tracker as well. And I had a, a, another question about, about the capabilities of this capture. So do you know like the base pair lengths to, to apply this sort of technology? I'm assuming there is a there is a length constraint. Yes. The ones that we are using right now, it's like 110 nucleotides long. And that is related to the 30 nucleotides that are like included in the baits per se. And we are also using uh, like flanking regions at the end. So, but uh, yes, limitations are according to the length that you can use, but uh, that length is working pretty well for us. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the other question that you, thanks for answering that, but let's just go ahead and, and present it live. So. Um, Lindsay also asked, what are the major considerations for researchers or industry in developing insect products, an insect product for supplemental animal feed, as far as the regulatory regulations for the FDA are concerned? Yeah, I kind of speak for the regulatory um, part, but uh, insects for animal food are actually regulated by the Center for Veterinary Medicine, CVM. And they do have a specific regulations according to the intended use, because for the intended use is very specific according to the animal that is going to be fed the insects and the type of uh, amount of uh, insect that is going to be included in the diet. But they do have a pre-market email as well. And um, if uh, you are, I don't have the email address here with me, but I can't and get the email address to, to you, Christine, and then you can send it back because they will be happy to answer those questions as well regarding the um, regulations for insects uh, for animal food. I had another question myself. Um, so you had mentioned this, this database um, that had uh, insects as well as others. And you had said that, that you are working to, to make this database even more robust. So I'm curious, how are species chosen? Sort of what are the, what's the future look like for that database? Well, eukaryotes are being deposited in public databases like all the time and very often, uh, luckily. So we are reviewing the um, those uh, public databases like on a frequent basis, and we are downloaded new sequences from eukaryotes like every year or sometimes like every two years or so. And based on the number of um, eukaryotic species, we kind of extract the insects and arachnids, and we can even um, modify or have like new uh, versions of the insect bait so that we are in more species every time. Of course, uh, this is the becoming most costly as we add some insect species because the number of baits increased, but uh, it's a good opportunity for us to add um, more species that are not currently in the database. That is why I mentioned that these can change as we add species into the database. So it's it's like a live um, tracker that we are using for that one because as the, the number of uh, species increases, then we can use them. Okay, great. Um, I think it's time to move along and we'll bring Monica back. So if you still have questions, please feel free to continue to ask those in the Q&A. Um, but I think we're going to go ahead and move on to our next uh, presenter. Thanks so much. Uh, so now I'd like to welcome, let me get myself organized here. I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Alita Espinosa, who is a research entomologist in genetics uh, research and development for EnviroFlight. And today she'll tell us about using biomarkers in black soldier fly breeding. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Elida Espinosa. Today I will be talking to you about using biomarkers in black soldier fly breeding. So first I'll discuss farming insects for food security. 
um, give you a brief introduction about BSF biology, talk about biomarkers, and then talk a little bit about their specific utility in black soldier fly production. So by 2050, we know that our population will have surpassed 9 billion people on this planet. And by 2100, we will have reached 10.4 billion people. So this increasing global population has a significant impact on our planet in several ways, including habitat destruction, loss of biodiversity, and has overall increased the demand for resources such as food, water, energy, and land, which can just result in the overexploitation, depletion, and degradation of our planet. Um, so for example, the demand of animal-derived protein is expected to double by 2050, putting a significant pressure on the planet's resources and ecosystem. So part of addressing these challenges will really require concerted efforts to promote sustainable development and reduce the ecological footprint of human activities. And so we're left with the very important call to action. And the United Nations has outlined the sustainable development goals uh, and the world's best plan to improve the health of the planet. So these goals are 17 goals that were adapted by the United Nations uh, General Assembly in 2015 as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. They're intended to guide and coordinate um, international development efforts for the next 15 years in order for us to achieve a better sustainable and equitable world by 2030. Overall, these goals cover a wide range of sustainable development issues like land use, water management, poverty, hunger, health, education, gender equality, uh, and more. So each goal has a specific target. There's an indicator measure uh, for its progress and they're interconnected and interdependent to really highlight the holistic approach um, towards this sustainable, sustainability goal. And specifically, insect farming can play uh, an important role as an innovative industry that contributes to this effort. So insect livestock require less land, often due to the footprint and vertical farming practices uh, that are used, especially if managed responsibly and using less waste, fewer emissions in the efforts of producing these products. Uh, they have the potential to help the planet in a number of ways. So for starters, they're also um, have this high nutritional value. They're a rich source of protein, healthy fats, vitamins, uh, and can be a nutritious addition to a lot of animal diets. Um, and so insects like the black soldier fly, the envirobug pictured here, um, mealworms and grasshoppers have already been shown to have similar high protein content to other types of meat such as beef and pork and it just creates this high efficient source of food and feed um, that is not your conventional livestock but does require fewer resources to produce so for many reasons insects uh, do offer this innovative market within the agricultural landscape and offer this promising solution in promoting these sustainable food systems um, just for our overall footprint. Specifically, Enviroflight um, focuses on the commercial farming of the black soldier fly. So with this insect, and specifically at the larval stage, uh, we are creating a system that's highly efficient requires less water, land, all of the things I mentioned before, um, and really contributing to this more regenerative approach to agriculture. We're continuously working towards establishing target values that maximize this, this sustainability. And in doing that, um, we've developed different products for different uses in animal feed. Some of these target values specifically for commercial production, um, I would say focus on two aspects, either external or internal values, where our external target values focus more on what the black soldier fly can offer to the consumer, namely quality nutrition, value add to a wide variety of animals. And this mostly happens during our larval stage, uh, which is the stage, life stage that we harvest. 
Then we have internal target values, which focus more on the black soldier flight itself. So ensuring that the health and performance of our insect, our mini livestock, um, is continuous by way of monitoring its growth, development, and reproduction in all life stages. So there's a lot of data that we collect, and there's various ways in which we can utilize this data. But are there other data that we could be collecting alongside us monitoring these target values? And the answer is yes, we can always collect more data. But purposefully, uh, we can bring and begin to design experiments that create frameworks that understand, um, well, that help us understand underlying biological responses, specifically pinpoint areas of, of these responses, um, and give a lot more information about animal status. So for example, a biomarker. Uh, here's this example of rapid identification of a chromosomal abnormality in cattle using qPCR um, to identify carriers um, and Hi everyone, I think we had a little, we're having a little glitch, so we're gonna try to figure that out on our end. Just hold on one moment, one moment, please. Manifestation of this abnormality in this cattle. It has an indicator of underlying biological responses, specifically pinpoint areas of, of these responses. Um, and give a lot more information about animal status. So for example, a biomarker. Uh, here's this example of rapid identification of a chromosomal abnormality in cattle using qPCR um, to identify carriers um, and And there's several examples of these. Um, I think one of the most common examples we can think of is, you know, our blood pressure, our pulse. Um, so just through basic chemistries or even more complex laboratory testing of different tissues. And uh, we can figure out and assess pathogenic processes, pharmacological responses, um, and potentially introduce some type of intervention to help with our own health, the health of our animals, and potentially the health of our of our mini livestock. So biomarkers as a tool that we can develop to inform us about health status, nutritional needs, deficiencies, pathogens, disease, environmental exposure, breeding, and selection. Why haven't we developed biomarkers in insect farming? What commercial applications do insect biomarkers have? So we'll get a little bit into that. Now so health and immunology. It's where it all starts, right? The health monitoring, understanding the baseline of our insects' health and performance. This requires vigilant observation. We truly have to be farmers tending to the welfare of our livestock, um, defining performance metrics and the expectations that come along with the environmental conditions in which they exist. And these deviations that we may identify um, can sometimes be perceived as stressors in our insects. 
So want to keep note of those um, because they can be detrimental to our insect health. So the environment is extremely fundamental to their performance. Uh, it can enhance performance in appropriate conditions, but it can also hinder the efficiency of the production operations otherwise. So there's a lot that can happen. And long before we were ever involved, uh, insects have developed like a plethora of strategies to ensure their survival. So they don't need us as much as, as we might think. For example, heat trap proteins. These are ubiquitous and conserved protein families found in all kinds of living organisms that help them maintain proteostasis and combat different stressors that they might be faced with. And HSPs, heat shock proteins, are commonly used as biomarkers of environmental stress. Insects also have their immunity, so their innate immunity, which provides both cellular and humoral mechanisms to combat immune challenges. And this can be by way of phagocytosis, encapsulation, uh, phenyl oxidases, and antimicrobial peptides. We'll talk about heat shock proteins a little bit. So first, uh, they help insects maintain the cellular proteostasis and protect their cells. Uh, and a lot of environmental stressors, this can be abiotic or biotic, um, such as elevated temperatures, ultraviolet radiation, drought, dehydration, different types of metal or chemical exposures, uh, and just other phenomena that they might experience. And here specifically is a table of all the HSPs studied in a wide uh, variety of insect species showing or showcasing a bit um, how they have already been used as as ways to to monitor some of their responses to specific stressors and to date we have used them um, specifically with black soldier flies uh, but I do feel that they have been underused in promoting BSF health they're specifically two top or excuse me, two um, publications that focus on HSP 70 and 90 at different stages of the insect. This first study by Gianetto et al. 2017 focused on the second instar larva and the fifth instar larva, and they showed an increased expression in um, HSP 90 in the fifth instar larva. And then Malloway et al. 2021 similarly measured HSP and HS, HSP70 and HSP90, um, making comparisons between male and adult, or, or male and female adults um, at age four and age seven um, post-emergence, exposing them to different temperatures, and showed that there was an increased expression uh, both in HSP70 and 90 in the older male. So again, there's some work that has been done with the black soldier fly. But there's more to explore. I do believe we've barely started to scratch the surface. Um, there's a broader range of temperatures that can be tested, especially some that might align with specific um, production operations. We need to have a better understanding of the duration or exposure um, to these specific conditions, challenges of days versus hours, and how that response might change. And then overall, I think super important is to conduct longitudinal life history studies where exposure might happen early on or at a different stage um, within the life history of the insect and see how these impact not only that generation, but generations to come, these lasting effects of stress. And how can we apply this? Um, so what does HSP expression look like in high performing populations or individuals? Another question we might ask, what does this expression look like in different populations when they're challenged with changing um, environmental conditions? So we could identify um, conditions that are limiting to the health and performance of our overall insect and create a deeper understanding that helps us meet our goals. Um, which at the end is keeping our insect populations healthy and tip-top performance. There's also been studies conducted looking at expression of AMPs and black soldier flies. 
uh, black soldier fly larva. This specific study by Bruno et al. 2021 focused on lysozyme and AMP activity um, after injection with bacteria, looking at these specific um, mRNA transcripts at the fifth and star larva. And here we have a bit of a shift in the time points, starting with three, six, 14, 24, and 48 hours. Um, so what they found uh, was that expression, relative expression of these specific AMPs or lysozyme changed depending on the tissue type. So whether it was in the hemolymph or whether it was in the fat body. Um, and ultimately they created this um, really beautiful schematic of the insect's response um, to these immune challenges. So again, testing both gram positive and gram negative, um, we have a better understanding of the black soldier fly's reactivity um, and promptness to this activity in the face of a challenge. So again, these activation pathways of insect immunity are highly conserved. Um, and specifically across species, the live histories and the environmental adaptations that specific insects have create complexity and variation in that response. So relative to other insects, um, the black soldier fly larva do activate their humoral responses um, within the first three hours and continue to prime their immune system with AMP activity long after those first three hours. So it's really cool to see, super awesome study. Um, how can we apply what we've learned or how can we apply these specific uh, brand scripts in using them towards applications for black soldier fly breeding. So can we use lysozyme and AMP? Um, and I would say, yes, there's great potential to create diagnostic tools for future insect pathology. We can drive selection in populations with increased AMPs for disease resilience. So this is for breeding purposes or also for value add purposes in what we can offer our consumer. And specifically, I have focused mostly on molecular biomarkers for several reasons. So namely, qPCR, I think it's generally available in, in many labs and it allows for the gene expression of a single or dozens of genes at a time. Uh, normalization can be used with reference genes, so comparison is, is um, easier. They can be developed and tested without the need of high throughput. Um, so either high throughput sequencing platform reagents that come along with that. You can gain relatively real-time results, so hours versus days, depending on um, other techniques that might need to be used to process or look at a at a specific cytology of an insect or something like that. And it offers the use of various biological sample types. You're not limited so long as you can collect nucleic acids from that. And I have outlined the following pipeline for molecular biomarker discovery in BSF. So we can leverage the omics platforms to collect large biological data sets, be it transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, and the genome. Um, and we can target differential expression or translation within these, these omic uh, platforms. Just again, to begin to understand uh, some of what's there and target um, some of the telltale indicators or biomarkers for a given biological process. There's also homology. So there's a lot of uh, genes that have been studied in other dipteran species and other insects that we can continue to use and, and see how they play um, within the black soldier fly system. And upon discovery and development, we would move into some type of analytical validation or testing. Um, again, we first have to understand performance metrics. 
create and design the proper test conditions where we can ask these questions, where we can see changes that then we can track um, as part of the differential expression in the use of this molecular biomarker. Um, and along with that, um, validate specific reference genes for that study and monitor the specificity, sensitivity, accuracy, and precision of a given marker. Then we have to do the functional validation of the testing. Do we have multiple populations where we can test uh, the use of this biomarker and capture some of the variants that might occur within a population or across a species? And then do that to define the predictive values that we will use for the biomarker. And then finally, when is the best time to use this biomarker? Um, how can we optimize this use within an experiment or within breeding operations? And here I get a little bit more into uh, some of the specifics on the analytical um, side of the development. So focusing really on some of the minimum information for publication of quantitative real-time PCR experiments uh, document produced by Bustin et al. in 2009. This continues to be a great resource uh, that ensures relevance, accuracy, correct interpretation, and repeatability of qPCR experiments, especially if we want to really use biomarkers as a tool for diagnostics, measuring, and tracking um, the performance of our population. And so final remarks. Um, we have to understand that at the end of the day, it's more than just this one point that we're capturing in time. Um, biomarkers do not provide absolute diagnosis. We really need to understand the context within the measurements uh, that we're obtaining. So we want to explore the genetic backgrounds of our black soldier flies uh, and the populations, uh, the microbiome associated with that specific population or um, animal, the environment in which this is occurring, uh, and the production system, whether small scale, large scale, that we're functioning under. Also, the presence of mRNA, specifically, as I was referring to, these molecular biomarkers slash qPCR um, does not equal protein translation. So we need to be able to corroborate results uh, with protein quantification methods or some other downstream um, manifestation of this measurement. But there's there's a lot. There's a lot that uh, that we can continue to grow and develop. Um, and really what I'm proposing here is an alternative application to a technology that already exists and that many brilliant scientists are already currently testing. I think further advancements in genomics and technology are just going to make this uh, use of molecular biomarkers um, a lot easier to attain, facilitate the process in which we uh, identify a potential biomarker and really that the possibilities are endless with where this can go and how we can use it. So thank you all for attending my symposium presentation. Uh, specific thanks to the virtual symposium organizers. Um, thank you. All right, thank you, Ellie, and I invite you to come on screen. Another fabulous presentation. So, hi. Uh, so the first question that I'd, I'd like to discuss is uh, how you all monitor insect health in your farmed colonies. That was submitted by an anonymous uh, person. You can speak yeah. more. So, I mean, I mentioned um, having to define me metrics, uh, so define performance metrics within the growth of your larva, um, the egg production within your colony, and really understand the conditions that you're providing them and measure those metrics. You, you begin to have an understanding of, of what their specific target weight is um, based on their ability to use the nutrients available to them in the feed. Um, and so usually anytime there's a deviation from that, 
Uh, we know that something may be up with the providing the appropriate conditions. And I think that's one of the, I think, more general approaches in which we monitor insect health. Another thing we do consistently is monitor um, just the genetic diversity of the population because we know that uh, that also plays a big role in their ability to just continue to propagate and, and maintain a population where they don't have difficulty exploiting the resources we're providing. And are there, this is a question for me, are there specific entomopathogens that worry you the most? I mean, do you have a few that you are like watching for? Or is there something that you're particularly worried about, like whether it be virus, bacteria, fungi? So not specifically. Um, and, and that in itself is a bit worrisome, right? Because there hasn't been any indication of specific pathogens uh, being present within black soldier fly populations. But I know there was a, a recent um, article published maybe a year ago talking about a black soldier fly pathogen called soft rot. So it was bacteria based. Um, so I think that's that's the first indicator or any type of publication that I've seen related to that. Um, so I would say for starters, bacteria. We know that the environment in which they 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 live in, it's their, you know originally like decomposers of these, these very gunky environments sometimes. So we know that they're likely facing those type of, of environments, um, specifically wild type populations and things like that. And we're trying to, to not expose them to that type of environment, obviously in, within the insect farming, um, very much a controlled setting, but that's, you know, our specific operation. So there's different operations, there's different scales, there's different um, feed sources that are given to them. So I think it can be a possibility um, depending on the risks associated with the with the feed that you use or the 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 scale at which you work with. I have one more question I'll, and then I'll invite, I didn't do it last time, I'll invite Brenda if she has a question too, but you had mentioned uh, sort of looking at the microbiome as well. Are, are there efforts to sort of like ca characterize what is a normal microbiome so that potentially you can monitor and see if there's there's changes in that? Yeah, there's there's been some really good studies uh, focusing, I can think of some focusing on like the core microbiome of, of a black soldier fly larva. Um, there's also been uh, studies looking at the, mi the, yeah, the microbial communities of specific life stages um, for the insect. But I think all of this and some of like the really cool insights that we've gained as we learn more about the microbiome is that a lot of it is based on, on the environment, right? It's like this, this huge factor, like what's going to be there is based on the limitations of what that environment will allow and based on what's what's already been there. So I think when we think about the microbiome and how it may be involved, um, we need to think about maybe not the specific species um, that we're looking at, but the functions which those species might provide uh, within their existence as part of the core um, biology of the insect. All right, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Brenda in case she has questions, but uh, I also just wanna say, if you had any, continue to ask your questions in the Q&A and um, uh, I'm sure Ellie will respond to those and then we can also discuss them after our last speaker, which is gonna I'm gonna turn it over to you, Brenda. Um, hi, Ellie. I, I was uh, curious about the uh, value added products that you talked about and <clears throat> I was wondering, Maybe you can't talk about, you know, about this because maybe this isn't uh, tied up in IP, but what are the opportunities for uh, insect-based research for uh, for downstream products in the U.S.? I mean, that, what kinds of, of products are, are you focused on um, and, and customer base? Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of, of I would say... Um, what EnviroFlight has done the past couple of years is uh, first establish the, re the regulatory aspect of us being able to provide a market for different animals. And so I would say that within the, the 
the regulatory definitions of our ingredient, um, which includes salmonids, uh, poultry, swine, pets. I think there's there's a lot of different paths that can be associated with one, the ingredient that we're creating, how it might be used, and the amount that might be used for the diet of a given animal. So I think it really depends on, on what that animal needs, like the final consumer needs, um, and maybe targeting an ingredient that can be more focused towards maybe increased uh, you know, fatty acids of a specific type um, with some of the amino acids of, of another um, maybe insect fed on something specifically. So I think, I think it's still, uh, there's, there's, there's still a lot of directions in which um, the product can be developed. Um, and some of the, some of the, I guess what you hear a lot of with the, um, with the value add is like this emphasis on like lauric acid and it being like this, this very important uh, fatty acid that we sometimes can only source from, you know, coconut oil or things like that. Um, so it has its in itself like antimicrobial properties. So then how can, you know, um, an enviro flight oil or some type of black soldier flight oil um, be integrated into the diet of a species that might benefit from that type of um, activity uh, within their system. So I think I think there's there's a lot of different ways that that people can go and and really I think it, it comes back to the the consumer, so the the person wanting to feed this organism to maybe inform us of like better ways in which we can create a product that can benefit that organism specifically. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think Kristen, I'm, I'm um, I, I don't have any more questions. Uh, does anyone, did we get any other questions in? No, I don't think so. I think we can wrap up uh, Ellie's uh, presentation and, and keep moving along. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, I have the uh, the privilege of introducing to, uh, <clears throat> Kristen for this next uh, talk. She uh, agreed yesterday to step in uh, when we had a, a, a speaker cancellation, and she gave a really great talk at uh, the Entomological Society meeting in the fall. And I think it's her talk is based on on that talk. Um, but to give a little bit more background about what Kristen does, she is, is the major uh, insect pathologist working with uh, the Grand Challenges Group in the ARS, and I think she'll talk about that uh, a little bit, uh, but it's, it's an important area in developing methods and ways that we can um, recommend that these insect companies and these insect farms monitor uh, insect health and and uh, and also identify potential pathogens in insects. So that, that's the questions that have been coming from Kristen related to that. Um, and so uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Kristen now and uh, and Pia can uh, can start that talk. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, everyone wherever you're uh, tuning in from. A um, little bit of change of plans, so I am subbing in for one of our um, participants who unfortunately had to back out last minute, so hope you'll indulge me um, to hear a little bit about some of my work. So. I'm excited to tell you today about how the USDA ARS is securing the health of the emerging field of insect agriculture. I first wanna tell you that I am a proud member of the mini stock team, uh, which was formed as a Grand Synergies Challenge back in 2020. Mini stock stands for a model for insect inclusion in sustainable agriculture. And it's also a play off the term mini livestock. We are a very mighty team made up of over 45 ARS scientists and postdocs across over 20 research units and at 19 locations and cutting across almost all national programs. 
This map shows where we are located and clearly you can see that we span all areas, including internationally. Our 45 scientists make up a diverse portfolio of ARS expertise, ranging from entomology to molecular and microbiology, animal science, chemistry, and more. And we are building off of many, many decades of experience and reputation in the agricultural industry. We are organized but work synergistically across seven groups that importantly build upon our existing research goals. And today I'm going to tell you about the work that I help lead within the Insect Diseases Working Group. So growing enough affordable food almost invariably requires rearing a lot of individuals close together. These dense populations present a continuous risk of widespread outbreaks by infectious diseases due to pathogenic microbes. And without question, infectious diseases poses one of the largest and most pervasive risks to food production. The FAO estimates that plant diseases cost the global economy over $220 billion a year. And here in the US, the USDA estimates that livestock pathogens result in the loss of over $17 billion annually. And it's because of this that the USDA invests considerable efforts towards the prevention and spread of diseases in agriculturally important species. Uh, and I'm assuming that today we're going to hear some of them, or we have heard some of the many benefits of incorporating insects as protein and as waste remediators, with one of the main selling points being that we can really mass rear these animals, sometimes literally on top of each other in vertical farms in a very small amount of space. So, for example, here is a graph. See if I can show you with my pointer. Um, here is a graph uh, showing the pounds of protein production per acre. And clearly, black soldier fly comes out as the winner over chicken, soy, pig, corn, and cattle. In fact, some companies estimate that they house trillions of insects in a single location. And even smaller farms are estimating that they have insects in the many hundreds of thousands. And so if you think about this in terms of total number of susceptible hosts, this far out, out exceeds the largest factory farms of traditional livestock, where large CAFOs are defined as having far, far less animals in an, an enclosed space. Needless to say, this scenario, while obviously absolutely beneficial for sustainable protein production and waste remediation, poses a high risk of disease outbreak by opportunistic pathogens. Because insects, like any other agricultural species, have their own set of microbial pathogens that cause disease for the insects themselves, which we call entomopathogens. And companies rearing insects have already felt the burden of disease in their facilities. We can look to the cricket industry in particular, which probably has one of the longest histories of mass rearing for pet and animal feed for a clear example of the cost of disease, because they have been particularly hard hit by viral pathogens. For decades, cricket farms globally have faced threats of colony collapse from several viral outbreaks, including cricket paralysis virus and Akita domesticus densovirus. When these outbreaks occur, some have lost their entire, have lost entire generations of crickets, costing those hit hardest their entire business. For example, this Canadian grower uh, claims that he lost more than 60 million crickets on his farm within 10 days. In fact, a countrywide outbreak of Akita domesticus densovirus here in the US led many to totally switch the species of crickets they reared to one that was thought to be resistant, who I'll tell you about a little bit more later. Importantly, these epizootics are often discovered late, after which preventing disease spread becomes difficult and sometimes impossible. And so what can be done? Who can help this growing industry become resistant to these kinds of outbreaks? Well, as many of you know, there is an entire field of research that very much cares about the diseases of insects. In fact, we have been thinking about diseases of insects for literally thousands of years. 
For example, the first reported disease of silkworms dates back to around 700 BCE in China. And even Aristotle described foul brood and honeybees in his history of animals around 300 BC. Consequently, these two long commodified species, silkworms and honeybees, have been extensively studied for disease management. And the Agricultural Research Service is home to some of the world's leading insect pathologists, working both to kill insect pests, but also to protect these economically and environmentally important species. And one of the testaments to our strong reputation in the field is that the leading insect pathology textbook is primarily written by ARA scientists. So many stock is utilizing this wealth of ARS knowledge in the field of insect pathology to now tackle the diseases impacting the production of insects as food and feed through our insect diseases working group, which I feel very fortunate to help lead. Our team is made up of insect pathologists, entomologists, and molecular and microbiologists across ARS. And we currently have three main objectives. The first, uh, we are putting considerable effort towards disease surveillance to create working catalogs of known and novel entomopathogens in reared populations. Concurrently, we are looking towards developing rapid and importantly affordable diagnostics to be used by producers, allowing them to detect disease occurrences early on in their farms to prevent large scale epizootics. Second, we are working to understand how worrisome entomopathogens are transmitted and how insects resist infection, both of which could better inform far farming and breeding practices. And finally, we ultimately want to develop intervention and therapeutic strategies to protect the health of this industry. Now, this group is made of several diverse projects working across multiple species, but today I'm solely going to focus specifically on my work in reared crickets. And I first want to tell you about a recent disease surveillance project. So we specifically were interested in screening for potential entomopathogenic viruses on cricket farms, because while we had some guesses from incidental reports in academic journals, we had not until this time really known the prevalence and abundance uh, on these farms. So I reached out to several producers and research labs across North America to obtain samples from their location. We also included a wild caught uh, population. Um, all of this was for untargeted metagenomic sequencing. Importantly, we implemented a technique which enriches viral particles. And this is important because it cuts down the amount of genetic material from other sources prior to sequencing. From this, we found lots and lots of viruses, including those that we expected, such as cripoviruses, densoviruses, aridoviruses, and ifloviruses. What we did not expect to see was the high prevalence of potential entomopathogens on farms. Indeed, 15 out of the 20 populations test, tested positive for at least one known cricket pathogen. I want to mention here that this is actually likely a conservative estimate, and I'm currently working on targeted qPCR detection in these samples, which provides incredibly precise results on viral prevalence. Additionally, we found a lot of no totally novel, uncharacteristic or uncharacterized viruses on 11 out of 20 farms. And most strikingly, crickets on 100% of the farms that we screened had co-infections, meaning that we found at least two, but more often at least three or four viruses on each farm. Now, while this tells us which viruses are present, it really doesn't tell us anything about pathology. To do that, I have a unique, the unique opportunity to study pathology in this cricket that I'm showing you here, Grilotis sigillatus, or the banded cricket. And one of the interesting things about this cricket is that this is the species that many growers switched to during the Akita domesticus densovirus outbreak that I mentioned earlier. But I have access to two populations of, this, of these crickets, one that's apparently healthy, and the other, which is very much suffering from disease, you can see in the nice contrast here is a healthy individual, and this is a diseased individual. And what's really unique about these two populations is that they're actually from the same ancestral wild caught population 
and they're reared in nearly identical condition, uh, identical conditions. But the thing is that they were separated, they've been separated for about six years and kept in two different lab locations. And now one continuously suffers from disease while the other does not. Okay, so what are the symptoms of this, this diseased population? Well, for one, they smell absolutely terrible. Uh, on top of that, individual diseased individuals usually have very bloated abdomens. They are slow and sluggish. And of course, you see really high mortality, especially once populations reach adulthood. And really strangely, females who do make it to adulthood will sometimes have underdeveloped or totally absent ovaries. Also, diseased crickets have a have stark white hemolymph that appears iridescent under lighted microscopy. And this iridescence actually comes from these virions that I'm showing you here. So each of these is a, a virion. And the light reflects off the sides of this virion, which has a polyhedral shape, and it results in the iridescence, which I think is pretty neat. Okay, so what is this virus? Well, we were fortunate enough to have captured this virus's entire genome, which actually wasn't that hard since it's pretty big at just under 200,000 base pairs. Uh, we found this using untargeted metagenomic sequencing. We determined this virus to be closely related to a previously reported lizard cricket aridovirus, which is so named for the fact that it causes pathology not only in crickets, but also in lizards and other reptiles that were fed infected crickets. And this genome, uh, we ended up publishing it um, a few years back, and this was uh, ended up being the most complete genome of this virus to date. Okay, but how can we be confident that the cricket aridovirus that I showed earlier is what's causing this disease? Well, besides doing a full Cox postulate experiment, one thing we can do is measure viral loads to give us a clue. And so here I'm going to show you the number of copies of aridovirus across these two populations. And this was done using quantitative PCR. So for diseased crickets, we found a lot of viral copies. In fact, we estimate that each cricket had about 1.5 trillion viral copies present. And I'd like to just give you a sense of how jam-packed these crickets are with this virus. So here I'm about to show you several really nice TEM images that uh, we obtained from collaborators at the National Animal Disease Center in Ames, Iowa. And these are from the fat body cells of diseased crickets. So again, all of these little dots here are is, uh, each represent one virion. And so once you start to, to zoom out, you can see all of these individual virions and how this cell is just absolutely jam-packed uh, with the riddle virus. Okay, so what about healthy crickets? Uh, based on what we know about this nasty virus, they should be totally clean, right? Well, no, we they too have viral copies of cricket aridovirus. However, at much, much lower levels um, than diseased individuals. And besides aridovirus, we also found low levels of that darn Akita domesticus densovirus in both populations, so both disease and healthy individuals. Now, even though we found significantly higher loads of uh, Akita domesticus densovirus in diseased crickets, we don't think that this densovirus is what's causing pathology, as these numbers are not even close to what we found uh, for aridovirus. And so here we found that cricket aridovirus can occur as both overt or apparent infections, but also as covert or asymptomatic infections with low viral loads. Additionally, it seems that Akita domesticus densovirus also occurs as a covert infection in these two populations. And this, I would argue, is quite concerning for large-scale farms, because while most have incredibly strict hygienic standards to keep opportunistic pathogens out, these findings, as well as the earlier surveillance project, suggest that some really worrisome viruses might actually already be in these facilities hiding out as covert infection. The open question remains, what is it about these two populations uh, that are different? Why does this population succumb to high aridovirus loads while this one does not? 
Well, we absolutely want to know the answer to this because we want to provide data-driven solutions to mass rearing operations. But to do that, we need to first perform some foundational descriptive studies to understand the immune defenses in these crickets, two viruses. Using again our two populations, we first just wanted to see if there were any differences in immunity caused by active cricket arotavirus infection. To do this, we measured the measured the expression of genes that were thought to that are thought to be important in cricket immunity based on other model insect species. And so here I'm going to show you the relative expression of, uh, in this case, Dicer 2 which is an important component of the RNAi or RNA interference pathway, which is the main insect defense system against viruses. And as you can see, diseased crickets have a much higher expression of Dicer2 compared to healthy crickets. And this is the same pattern uh, across all components of the RNAi pathway that we measured. Diseased crickets had higher gene expression compared to healthy crickets. And in fact, we saw overall higher expression of diseased crickets across all canonical immune signaling pathways, including the toll IMD, or the, excuse me, the toll pathway, the IMDB pathway, and the JAK-STAT pathway. And we also found higher expression of lysozyme, which is an important antimicrobial effector in orthopterans. And so all of this together tells us, at least at the transcriptional level, diseased crickets can mount a robust immune response to iridovirus. Now, how effective that actually is, is obviously in question because at the end of the day, these crickets are, the diseased crickets are quite sick and suffer significant mortality. Still, this provides some clues as to which genes we might wanna target for future breeding efforts, for example. And so I'd like to conclude with a few select future directions for our working group. First, we are currently looking at global gene expression between these two populations using RNA-seq transcriptomics to further understand host response to infection at the transcription level. This data should hopefully be out within the next year. Next, we are assessing how diet-associated microbiota impacts health outcomes of diseases as a potential prophylactic measure to maintain disease-resistant resist crickets by bolstering their beneficial gut microbiomes with food. Additionally, we are working to improve the genetic resources for reared insects, which is so criti critical, especially for the molecular methods we use for disease surveillance as well as genetic improvements. And finally, we are working with other ARS scientists to develop, to develop sustainable and hygienic rearing substrates and methods to reduce the growth of opportunistic pathogens during rearing and egg laying to ensure continuous healthy populations. And with that, I would thank you all for, again for the last minute change. Thanks for sticking around and um, I'll welcome any questions um, as you have them. Thanks. Okay, um, we have a quite bunch of, uh, of participants this morning, <laughs> but feel free to raise your hand if you want to jump in, or <clears throat> if you are, you know, more reserved, you can always type things into the chat. Oh, it looks like we just had a question submitted by Hunter. Uh, do you know the transmission mechanism of the aritavirus? That's a great question, and it's one that we can't. It's one that we're actively exploring because we have some working hypotheses um, on how it's transmitted. Or, or in our case, it seems like whoever we measure, they have a rotavirus already, and so there's this idea that perhaps it's vertically transmitted, but perhaps it's also so that it could be both vertically and horizontally uh, transmitted, so that potentially it can. Um, it can live in, so iridovirus loves to live in damp, warm environments, which is like, that's what we eat for egg laying. Um, it's, it's a damp, warm environment. And so um, all of that to say, we're not 100% sure, but we that's something that we're actively um, exploring. 
Okay, and um, I think uh, I see uh, something about Philip has his hand raised. Can somebody unmute him? Yep, uh, I just did so he should be able to talk. Okay. All right, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Cool, so um, <laughs> I was just wondering with the enrichment that you did in the sequencing uh with that do you remember the percentage of the reads that you got that were still cricket no i don't i don't have that number offhand i know it wasn't it's obviously wasn't perfect um but i don't have that number offhand i can certainly chat about that offline um but yeah it's not perfect so definitely we okay. still had cricket no no i mean the, honestly that we're just we're sort of in the same boat of like, well, we want to get everything. We don't want to do the traditional six ness right uh, meta metagenomic approach, and we want to sort of incorporate everything looking at xeno surveillance. But we want to limit the amount of like insect DNA that we get in there. And so, just you know, it's, it's nice to know that there are other people sort of looking at these challenges and things like that. So I was just curious if you had had that information because we'll be doing something very similar where we're testing ways in which we're reducing like physically reducing the amount of insect input that goes in to our uh library prep so yeah absolutely and i'm happy to send along the methods that we've adapted from so it's like a, it's a filtering you know a, a sequential sort of filtering and then it's adding specific nucleases to hopefully get rid of everything that isn't a virus in our case. I don't know if you're looking for viruses specifically. The idea that it, it, um, whatever is in a capsid will remain while you get rid of other unprotected. Yeah, and, 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 and that might be the, the trick is to send them into different, you know, do, do full, you know, extraction, extract everything and then send them down different pipelines looking for this one specifically for viruses, this one specifically for uh, other pathogens and things like that. Um, so, but yeah, thank you. Okay, and we have a, an anonymous question. Have you looked outside of immune pathway gene expression? Could there be other genes involved in inhibiting disease, not just fighting back? Yeah, like so that is exactly the motivation for doing the whole global transcriptomics. So we really would like to see, we were just kind of targeting specific immune pathways, but the, the idea is that, yeah, we already have the data. It's now just going in and, and, and looking at that carefully. But absolutely, we're looking beyond just immune pathways. So that's a great point. And Hunter, I had a follow-up question to, uh, to your uh, comment. Does the viral enrichment work for DNA and RNA viruses? Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's supposed to, uh, again, it's not perfect, but yeah, it's supposed to capture both DNA and RNA viruses. Okay, and TC wanted to know if you had tested the rearing medium and if the ritovirus can survive in it. We did not. So um, for, for my sake, so how I rear my crickets, I rear them on egg cartons and then they um, oviposit in cotton wool. And so we have thought about that's kind of, we've looked at, you know, different sort of egg laying substrates. And so have it measure that ex, uh, explicitly, but yeah, that would be something something to look at. Sometimes we do get some interesting, like, interesting things that grow on our um, egg media. And Brad has thrown you a <laughs> an interesting question, but I'm not sure if we know the answer uh, to that. Do, Brad, do you want to ask your question? Um, certainly. Yeah, I was just curious in your presentation. You had. Uh, indicated that there was a many fold greater efficiency on a per acre basis compared to most livestock. But that's a little bit biased because obviously you can shove a lot of insects into a small space. Uh, but has there ever been a study to determine that, or for a comparison on a per pound of gain of food intake, i.e., some sort of efficiency ratings for insects compared to other livestock? I am sure that that has been done, and I'm, I'm sure I've seen that. I cannot pull that. Uh, out offhand. If someone knows and wants to put that in the chat, uh, please do, but uh, fair point, Brad. Okay, and I'm going to take the last question here before we go into opening it up for an open discussion. 
Um, at ESA, somebody asked you the question about Wolbachia and, and did you find it? And the reason that I was interested in that question is that when we sequenced the Akeda genome, uh, we found a, a lot of scaffolds that were aritavirus. Uh, we didn't find any densivirus scaffolds, but we did find aritavirus. And we, we were like, how can this insect survive with all of this, you know, this load of aritavirus? The same thing. Um, but I did find Wolbachia uh, also. And so I looked at the Wolbachia literature and I saw in Drosophila where Wolbachia can be a actual um, to protect the Drosophila against virus infections. So I just threw that in the paper as a, maybe this is what's going on, but I don't know. But I'm wondering if uh, if you looked at Wolbachia load in your covert and overt uh, insects, is maybe you would find something different there. Yeah, that's another, that's, um, so uh, I work with a, um, a vector biologist who's very interested in mosquitoes and see if he's very interested in Wolbachia. So we just kind of screened for that just for fun anyways. And we didn't find any Wolbachia in the Gerlodes populations that we've scanned, but I have found it in other wild caught crickets. And so, yeah, it's an interesting idea that potentially these um, endosymbionts like Wolbachia confer some protection, antiviral protection, but haven't haven't found that in the, the what I've looked at in the lab, but that's not to say that that it that it doesn't. But it's really interesting. Okay, I'm going to let Kristen take over now, uh, and we'll open it up. We'll invite the other speakers uh, back on, and uh, invite questions, just general questions for any speaker or for all speakers. Yeah, thanks. So I'll invite Ellie and Monica back on. Um, just to see if, if anyone else had follow-up questions or a general conversation. Uh, and again, feel free to raise your hand and, and we can promote you. Um, just looking through to make sure we haven't missed any. And Ellie or Monica, if there's anything that you got in the Q&A that you wanted to bring up to talk about more, happy to do so. Or I had the thought that maybe, you know, we could just talk about these these common themes of insect health and and um, uh, how the field is moving forward to try to address this and what are the research needs uh, as far as regulatory or companies uh, as far as what how can we support this? I think um I provided uh, some, just some examples, I guess, of different studies that that I feel like would offer a lot of information um, that we don't know about uh, just response of specifically the black soldier fly um, under specific conditions. And I think this applies to not just the black soldier fly, but also conditions that, you know, crickets um, and mealworms. So these other um, big players within the insects as food and feed that are being farmed. Um, like what comes about in those conditions? What, what should we expect to be the standard uh, metrics that we, that we can, you know, just build these data sets of, of their performance on? So like the question that I was asked um, about how do we track the health? I think that's, that's some of what we need to to do better, understand what what standard metrics of performance are within the variety of environments that do exist uh, within the the feed stocks that we provide them, um, and start to build this more almost like a meta analysis or meta data set of of what their their health is and and what we should define as a healthy insect within those standards. And Monica, you and, and Padmini and I have talked about using long read sequencing uh, as, a, as a, a way to monitor insect health. Um, what, what, where, are you, where is FDA on that right now? For the um, bacterial pathogens, uh, we're doing some research for long read sequences. 
Um, I just gonna add um, as well that um, industry like reading insects is like a huge challenge right now. And we see like different uh, adaptation, not just of the insects going into like the reading environment, which is a different environment as well. And that can affect the microbiota, but also um, the uh, mm, microbes, including viruses that Christine talked about. Uh, that can even be um, <laughs> um, like a disease in a particular insect that is being rare because just the environment is being changed. So industry has a lot of challenges as well. And um, regulatory speaking, it's um, something that um, needs to be worked out. And uh, we know like since they move from a small scale to large scale production of the insects, then more challenges are uh, um, arised. So um, this is something that uh, as if there is like some interest, not just insects as food, but also for insects as feed, uh, need, industry needs to be aware to contact uh, regulatory agencies as soon as possible so that there is like this commitment to work together and to benefit uh, not just uh, the industry, but also uh, consumers because the safety and the health of the consumer is the most important for the regulatory agencies. And um, there are like so many issues that needs to be explored as well and provide uh, a lot of uh, references and data that is going to help regulatory agencies to take decisions. So data, it's very important and um, this research results of all this research is very important for the regulatory agencies to take um, decisions and moving forward. Okay, thank you. I, I'm also a little bit worried. Uh, we do a lot of research. There are people in our group doing research and then there are all also people in other, in Europe and other places doing the research to develop this circular economy, taking uh, food waste, uh, or or waste in general and using insects to uh, use, th use that, uh, but that would introduce, I'm, I'm so afraid of introducing uh, pathogens and, and mm -hmm. other, other problems. And I'm wondering how is, what are your thoughts on whether this is feasible or not, or, uh, you know, it's a, it's a possibility. Yes, that's, that's a risk, actually. Uh, I know there are a lot of uh, research out there about how to use food waste, and they can use, uh, they want to use it to rare insects, but with waste comes a lot of challenges as well, especially like fungal pathogens can be introduced in the insects because insects, are, they, they have a really small metabolism and they absorb whatever they eat, right? So we don't know how that is going to affect the microbiota. And um, we've seen a lot of research going on as well about the type of treatments that are being done to a specific food waste. So that, um, again, it's also something that needs to be explored and uh, provide more data, just making sure that uh, whatever the substrate is, um, the one that is given to the insects is gonna be safe. So a lot of uh, potential research in there as well. And Ellie, is uh, Enviro, Virofly doing that kind of research? Are you looking at that with Black Soldier Fly? Um, so there's a lot of uh, research that we do in testing different, um, I guess, like side streams for like byproduct side streams. I would say that within that research, um, some of the things that we look at are, are, you know, how does the insect do? How does it grow? Um, I don't know that there's too much work that that we've specifically like spent maybe on like the like microbial diversity of those specific um, waste streams, but I can say that they tend to be more like waste streams produced by some type of a large manufacturing operation. Um, so including for example, the the feed that we currently use for the for the insects that we rear, one of the things that we're trying to do in maintaining a a consistent product is use a consistent feed, um, something that we know where it's coming from. We're mitigating risk, and so 
one of the main, uh, I guess, feed substrates that we use to feed our insects are like DDGs, these dried distilled grains. Um, so for now, we haven't really been faced with introducing that, that type of a risk. But I do know that there's other companies um, in the U.S. that do focus on recycling more of these like organic uh, waste streams of of um, different different type of like uh, whether it's like a byproduct of something or if it's some type of like food waste stream uh, type of thing. So now I think it's it's a valid question, a valid concern, um, and there there has to be ways for us to to mitigate the risk because I think that's where some of the 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 real impact in terms of sustainability can happen. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kristen, do you have more questions? I don't think so. And I'm looking at the time and and I appreciate the folks that are still uh, have still stuck around, but I, I think if everyone else is all right with it, we can we can maybe wrap up for today. And, and again, I just want to thank so much. A uh, big thanks to our speakers and our organizers and for all of you for attending. And um, be sure to join us again. I don't have a handy what the date of our next one. It's in April. I don't know, if Brad, you can chime in, remind everyone when our next one is um, that they can join us. But um, thank you all. And I'll just, uh, I, I say, I think that we're still going to continue the Slack channel so that these questions will be transferred to the Slack channel and you can sign up uh, there if you have follow-up questions or if you wanna get in touch with the speakers, um, that's your opportunity. Yep, and I'll just quickly add, I dropped that uh, Slack invite into the chat earlier on and our next session, session two, Insect Genome Biology and Evolution by Perky, uh, Lindsay Perkin will be on April 10th at the same time. Thanks, Brad. Thank you so much for the invitation. We really appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you for organizing this. It's really great. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone.